Hello, my name is Dawn Eden Goldstein. Actually, in New York, it's Dawn. In Texas, it's Dawn Eden Goldstein. And I'm delighted that you're joining me uh, for this reading course on Pope John Paul II's Apostolic Letter on Christian Suffering, Salvafici Dolores. So just a little about me. You can learn more about me from uh, visiting uh, my blog, Dawn Eden, D-A-W-N-E-D-E-N, dot blogspot.com or also visiting me on Twitter at Dawn of Mercy. Uh, right now I'll just uh, very quickly uh, tell you uh, the things about me that you can uh, know from from looking at my rings. So this ring on on my right hand uh, with this little red stone uh, is the red is for uh, theology and uh, it's because, or it, I, I received this this ring as a gift from my from my mother and stepfather when I earned my doctorate in sacred theology in 2016 from the University of Saint Mary of the Lake Mundelein Seminary, and my dissertation was on recent magisterial teaching on redemptive suffering. The magisterium being the teaching office of the Catholic Church. So one of the chapters of my dissertation was on uh, St. John Paul II's Theology of Suffering, and particularly uh, the uh, letter that we will be uh, reading uh, in, in this course. Uh, this other ring that I wear on my uh, left hand uh, is, uh, it, it, it was a gift uh, from a friend, um, my friend Kathy Schmuggy. It belonged to her late mother, uh, Wanda, wonderful holy woman, and uh, I've um, adopted this ring as my dedication ring uh, because I've dedicated my uh, celibacy to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary so that I might live the mystery of spiritual motherhood in the world, in the heart of the Church. So with that uh, about me, um, we will now go straight to Salvafici Dolores. Um, and my goal is to read it with you. I'll read uh, a few sentences or a sentence and comment on it. And uh, each of these sessions, I imagine, will be about half hour or so, give or take. And together, uh, we will read through this whole apostolic letter. Uh, as you can see, I'm um, looking at it. Uh, from the Vatican uh, website, vatican.va. If you just put in uh, Salvafici Dolores uh, into Google, though, uh, it should come right up. And uh, as you can see, it's from 1984. If we look carefully at this, we'll see that it's, that it's uh, from, uh, this is how the Vatican dates its dates its um, web, web pages, um, 11 meaning the 11th of February, 1984, um, which is uh, the day of the Feast of Our Lady of Lourdes, uh, at the Feast of Mary as she's known uh, in her office as, as uh, Our Lady of Lourdes, um, for her apparition at, at, at Lourdes, but it's her office as as a um, as a saint who is specially designated as a um, vehicle of God's love to the sick uh, and the and the suffering. So so there's a, a special symbolism in John Paul choosing that date to issue this letter. And as you can see, he's writing to his brother bishops and also all, um, all uh, the faithful, bishops, priests, religious families, and all the faithful of the, of the church. He begins by writing, declaring the power of salvific suffering, the Apostle Paul says, in my flesh 
I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Now, this verse is from Colossians 1.24, which is a crucial text for understanding the meaning of Christian suffering. Uh, and what this text means, this rather mysterious text, which suggests that somehow we can complete Christ's sufferings as St. Paul did. Um, well, John Paul will explain in the context of this letter what he means by that, and as he'll explain, it doesn't mean that anything uh, is, uh, in fact, um, lacking in Christ's sufferings. Uh, he is saying uh, that, that rather, as we'll see, Christ has suffered for us, but in a mysterious way, Christ also would like to suffer in us. That is to say that even though Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord is in heaven now, and he's risen and no longer sufferings, yet in a mysterious way, he's united himself with every human being. And so he wants each of us to, in our way, own our share in his sufferings. He suffered, Jesus Christ suffered on earth at a certain point in time in his body. But as uh, Fulton Sheen uh, has put it, Jesus asks each and every one of us if he might also suffer in our body and in this way extend his redemptive suffering to every time and every place where there is a human being to experience it and in that way to redeem the world. It doesn't mean that all of us have to be suffering all the time, but it does mean that each of us has a certain suffering that is unique to us and that um, in our unique experience of suffering, we are in our union with Christ through our baptism in some way participating in the redemption that Jesus Christ has already won for the salvation of the world. So I'm sort of giving away the game here by telling you this, but it's beautiful to see how John Paul II explains it. So just to dwell for a moment longer on this first line, uh, John Paul is not writing in a vacuum. He, and I think this is, oh, that's my friend Stephanie there. Hello, Stephanie. I think, I think this is quite important. Um, the, the, Stephanie, by the way, is a friend of mine uh, who died of cancer. That's why I have her uh, picture as the screenshot, because she was someone who really understood redemptive suffering. Um, actually, I'll, I'll tell you about that because it's related to our story, and I won't forget what I was about to tell you about that first line of Salvafici Dolores, but um, Stephanie and I, Stephanie was my childhood friend. Um, we um, met in eighth grade, and uh, when, and she was born the same month, day, and year as I, oh, as I was. Uh, and we both, um, when we were in our uh, 40s, early 40s, actually, me just when I was, um, just when, uh, when I um, was um, 39, going on 40, um, so I guess late, late 30s, we both uh, received, we received, we both um, contracted, so to speak, thyroid cancer at the same time. Um, and Hers was more serious than mine, and I remember speaking with Stephanie when uh, we were talking about this, and she said that she believed that I was going to be well, and she believed, she said, that she took the bullet for both of us. That's redemptive suffering. It's only through the grace of the Holy Spirit that someone can, can, can say that. Um, Stephanie was... Um, 
in her body, filling up the sufferings of Christ for the, for the redemption of the world and also in the hope that God could use her sufferings to, to heal me physically as well. And in John Paul's encyclical, he's speaking primarily about offering up our sufferings for the salvation of the world, but also as a participation in Christ's healing ministry as a whole, which uh, in a secondary but still real way uh, includes physical healing as well. So we can also pray that, that God can use our sufferings for every kind of healing for those we love and for those of the whole world, while keeping in mind that the most important kind of healing for which God uses our sufferings, the primary kind, is for the spiritual redemption of the world. So now I'm going to go back to the first line of Salafici Dolores, with that line from Colossians 1.24. And uh, just to tell you that um, my point earlier was that John Paul is not writing uh, in a vacuum, as though he's the first human being commenting on these verses of script, sacred scripture. Uh, pardon my um, exaggeration, I don't mean to be uh, sarcastic, but you know, sometimes people take John Paul or the Second Vatican Council or Point X in history as being the time when the first first started speaking about these things. Um, but uh, there's anything that a pope says about uh, any aspect of human experience or theology, every pope knows, and this well includes Francis, that he's standing on the shoulders of giants and that he's building upon uh, those that others wrote before him. So in the case of this first line of John Paul's uh, apostolic letter, he knows as he's writing, that that very same verse, Colossians 1.24, was also used in a very important encyclical by Pius XII, Mystici Corporis. Um, for, some, um, for some reason, um, the, um, there's, there's a typo here that always bothers me. It's mystical with a Y. But anyway, uh, Mystici Corporis um, is, um, is Pius XII's uh, encyclical, which was very important for the theology of Vatican II. Uh, and in, in, in fact, Mystici Corporis is the most cited document of Vatican II outside of sacred scripture. And in the very first line, he says, the doctrine of the mystical body of Christ, which is the church. And that footnote one leads to Colossians 1.24. There were many um, passages of St. Paul uh, that Pius could have used to refer to the church being the body of Christ. But Pius chose Colossians 1.24 because he wanted to say something definite about how our membership in the church is in a special way tied to our suffering, that when we suffer, we'd never suffer alone. We always, as Christians, suffer in the body of Christ, and our suffering is always valuable because it's joined uh, to, uh, to the suffering of Christ himself, as well as the suffering of all those who are in the body, and that this gives our suffering through Christ uh, an infinite meaning. My finite suffering, your finite suffering, has infinite meaning and infinite value when joined to the suffering of Christ. So, um, to read further into John Paul's Salvifici Dolores, he goes on speaking of Colossians 124 and says, These words seem to be found at the end of the long road that winds through the suffering which forms 
part of the history of man and which is illuminated by the word of God. Now, I hate to break it to you, but when John Paul speaks of this long road that winds through the suffering, he is not speaking of that great Paul McCartney song with lots of strings added by Phil Spector on Let It Be. The long and winding road. Look at me in my old age, I'm turning into Christopher West. Next thing you know, I'll be singing about desire or something. But no, uh, John Paul is not speaking about, about the Beatles there. He is rather speaking about a certain message that uh, winds through his own uh, writings, particularly um, he's referring back to the very first uh, major encyclical of his papacy, Redemptor Hominis, uh, where he writes about the way. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and and the life. And in Redemptor Hominis, uh, particularly from uh, section uh, 11 onward, um, he speaks about Jesus Christ being the way. Here he says, Jesus Christ is the stable principle and fixed center of the mission that God himself has entrusted to man. A mission. What is a, a mission? A mission uh, comes from uh, comes from the the Lat- Latin um, uh, missio being sent. I am sent. And to be sent is to be sent in a particular direction. Jesus Christ is sent from the Father to return to the Father, and in his mission his direction, he shows us the road, he shows us the way. That road is the royal road of suffering. And that's what John Paul is getting at in Salvifici Dolores, when he speaks of the long road that winds through the suffering, which forms part of the history of man, and which is illuminated by the word of God. These words, Jean-Paul continues, have, the, have, as it were, the value of a final discovery, which is accompanied by joy. For this reason, St. Paul writes, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. That's the beginning of Colossians 1.24. The joy comes from the discovery of the meaning of suffering, and this discovery even if it is most personally shared in by Paul of Tarsus, who wrote these words, is at the same time valid for others. The apostle shares his own discovery and rejoices in it because of all those whom it can help, just as it helped him to understand the salvific meaning of suffering. Pay attention to that word, meaning. John Paul II is a phenomenologist. Uh, So he's interested in in phenomena, meaning experiences, human experiences, and how we find, as human beings, find meaning through our experiences. He goes on uh, in the second, in number two, Section number two, the theme of suffering, precisely under the aspect of this salvific meaning, seems to fit profoundly into the context of the holy year of the redemption as an extraordinary jubilee of the church. So John Paul is writing uh, in in, um, 1984, which is the uh, tail end of the year of the redemption, and even when he announced the holy year of redemption in 1982, he said that one of the themes of it would be that of redemptive suffering. So John Paul has been ruminating on this apostolic letter, on its contents, 
for some time before writing it. It's interesting in that uh, Salvafici Dolores comes at towards the end of John Paul's five-year cycle of Wednesday audiences that would become known as the, the theology of the body, or as John Paul called it, the catechesis on human love. And in his final audience of the catechesis on human love, John Paul notes, this is later um, in 1984, uh, that these audiences don't cover important topics related to the theology of the body, including that of suffering. So John Paul, even though he was giving his theology of the body audiences and knowing that suffering was part of the theology of the body, he chose to treat it separately in this apostolic letter, Salvafici Dolores. So this apostolic letter is meant to be read in conjunction with his audiences on the theology of the body and as part of that. The theology of the body is incomplete, John Paul says so himself, without this theology of suffering. So we'll just make it through the rest of this second uh, section and then we'll continue next time. Uh, so he's, he's written that, that this theme of suffering seems to fit in, seems to fit profoundly into the context of the whole year of the redemption as an extraordinary jubilee of the church. And this circumstance, too, clearly favors the attention it deserves during this period. Independently of this fact, it is a universal theme that accompanies man at every point on earth. In a certain sense, it coexists with him in the world, and thus demands to be constantly reconsidered. So suffering, John Paul's acknowledging here, it's a basic human experience. It's a fundamental human experience. He writes, even though Paul in the letter to the Romans wrote that the whole creation has been groaning in travail together until now, even though man knows and is close to the sufferings of the animal world, nevertheless, what we express by the word suffering seems to be particularly essential to the nature of man. It is as deep as man himself, precisely because it manifests in its own way that depth which is proper to man and in its own way surpasses it. Suffering seems to belong to man's transcendence. It is one of those points in which man is in a certain sense, destined to go beyond himself, and he is called to this in a mysterious way. So, with that point about human suffering being different from animal suffering, I'm going to take a sip of tea here and then um, leave you with uh, a reflection on that from John Hen Henry Cardinal Newman. So the reflection uh, is from um, John Henry Cardinal Newman's um, On the Mental Sufferings of Our Lord During His Passion. So uh, as I switch over to Newman, I want to tell you, I don't think that, um, that John Paul is um, unaware that he's dealing with something that's been dealt with by Newman and after Newman also in The Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis. Lewis uh, discusses suffering as well. I think John Paul is well uh, aware of, of that, and I think that there are some of Newman's observations that are um, within John Paul's uh, observations on suffering, but just in the background, because John Paul knew Newman. It was John Paul um, who, um, if I'm not mistaken, raised uh, Newman to uh, venerable on his way to, to sainthood. And, and I'm sure he um, spoke about or wrote about Newman in different places as well. But anyway, um, in Newman's mental homily on um, the mental sufferings of our Lord in his passion, he speaks about animal suffering in, um, in distinction 
between that and human suffering. Um, and um, he, he describes this in a paragraph uh, where he, um, he gives this example that hardly any one stroke of pain is intolerable. It's intolerable intoler when it continues. You cry out, perhaps, that you cannot bear more. Patients feel as if they could stop the surgeon's hand simply because he continues to pain them. Their feeling is that they have borne as much as they can bear, as if the continuance and not the intenseness was what made it too much for them. What does this mean but that the memory of the foregoing moments of pain acts upon and, as it were, edges the pain that succeeds? If the third or fourth or twentieth moment of pain could be taken by itself, if the succession of the moments that preceded it could be forgotten, it would be no more than the first moment, as bearable as the first, taking away the shock which accompanies the first. But what makes it unbearable is that it is the twentieth, that the first, the second, the third, on to the nineteenth moment of pain are all concentrated in the twentieth, so that every additional moment of pain has all the force, the ever-increasing force of all that has preceded it. Hence, I repeat, it is that brute animals would seem to feel so little pain because, that is, they do not have, they have not the power or of reflection or of consciousness. They do not know they exist. They do not contemplate themselves. They do not look backwards or forwards. Every moment as it succeeds is their all. They wander over the face of the earth and see this thing and that and feel pleasure and pain, but still they take everything as it comes and then let it go again, as men do in dreams. They have memory, but not the memory of an intellectual being. They put together nothing. They make nothing properly one and individual to themselves out of the particular sensations which they receive. Uh, I'll leave off reading from Newman here, but you know his point is, if you break it down, that animals have sensation, so they really do feel pain, but they don't have reflection. Um, and here I'm just repeating Newman, basically, but, um, but he's saying that, um, if I'm, if, if I'm getting a shot at the doctor's office, I know none of us like shots, I'm, even as I see the needle, I'm thinking of how much it hurt the last time I had to get a needle stick, and I'm, so already the pain is beginning for me with that memory. And then um, the pain continues even um, as, the, as the needle giving me the shot goes in. Um, whereas animals don't have that power of reflection to connect one moment of pain to the next. And um, Newman in this in this um, sermon says, now apply this to the sufferings of our Lord. Do you recollect them offering him wine mingled with myrrh when he was on the point of being crucified? He would not drink of it. Why? Because such a portion would have stupefied his mind and he was bent on bearing the pain in all its bitterness. Um, in my book, uh, in the introduction to my book, Remembering God's Mercy, I, I quote this from Newman and I explain what I'll share with you now, uh, namely that Newman brings out that Jesus chose not to drink the wine that would have drugged him because he wanted to experience pain not as an animal experiences it just in the moment, but pain as a human person experiences it, which is the pain that comes from being able to reflect on pain, the pain that comes from memory. And all that is within John Paul's uh, observation uh, that 
um, pain is something, suffering is, is um, particularly essential to the nature of, of man. It manifests in its own way that depth which is proper to man and in its own way surpasses it. Uh, so I uh, thank you for, st st for uh, studying this with me. Thank you for reading Salvafici Dolores with me and we'll pick up uh, next time from where we left off. I invite you to read further uh, in Salvafici Dolores uh, so that we can uh, so that we can continue to read on it and reflect on it uh, together. So until next time, um, you pray for me, I'll pray for you, we all pray for the Holy Father's uh, intentions, and God bless you.